Greg and Leah here with us, but we are especially featuring Greg Reese today. And I'm so excited for this conversation um, and really excited for Greg to share his, his wisdom and knowledge as a first generation farmer with us. And he's accompanied today by his partner and partner in crime and in life, as well as we are so lucky to have her, the amazing Le Leah Marisovich. She's the content producer here at Farmer's Footprint. So she handles all of our photography, videography, and is just a creative genius. So what's going on, guys? Hey. Hi, thanks, Tori. <laughs> um, cool. All right, well, we're going to kick things off. I think we have a critical mass of folks in here. Thank you guys for still putting in the chat where you're coming from and, you know, how you identify along the, the spectrum of being a land steward or an activist within this regenerative movement. So um, I wanted to just share quickly in case it looks like we have a ton of familiar faces in here today. So grateful to have everyone who's coming from the Farmer's Footprint community here with us. Um, but if this is your first time to one of our events, I'd love to share just a little bit about Farmer's Footprint. So we are a coalition of farmers and educators and doctors and scientists and business leaders. And our main thrust in the world, our ethos, our mission that we're sitting at is exposing the human and environmental impacts of chemical farming and really offering a path forward through regenerative agricultural practices. So the main way we're doing that is through this theory of change of storytelling. Um, so if you wanna follow along with those efforts, um, feel free to check out the Farmer's Footprint Instagram and through our Meet a Farmer series. And the lovely Greg here today with us um, just had an amazing feature. It's a week long kind of series where we do a blog post on them. Sometimes Leia creates um, you know, video assets that we get to share out and kind of create evergreen, beautiful, short film synopsis. Um, and then we do kind of some awesome interaction on the Instagram. So check that out. And I'm super stoked that you guys are all here today. And of course, there's gratitude for Greg being with us, but also to turn the tables a little bit and just say thank you to everyone here showing up, taking time. Um, I think really the power of the Farmer's Footprint community is to humanize this human mosaic of lived experiences within the regenerative community. Um, and I think in some ways we're doing that. We're creating spaces for the information of folks who are doing work in the community or even within the, you know, the online platform, connecting with each other to directly share that information and wisdom within this network. So within the storytelling piece, we are always aiming to remove our lens and give the community, you guys, direct access to the thought partners and regenerative players within this space. Um, it's just how we grow together, right? So frequently learning from the lived experiences of others is, is one of the most beautiful ways I think that we can step out and continue taking steps along this journey, no matter where on the spectrum of being a land steward you are. So we are gonna hop into the session. So we'll take some time and hear from Greg um, on his experiences and the journey that led him to the amazing spot that he's at today. And then we'll transition to questions and answers. So that'll be your guys' time to shine, get all those burning questions out. And Greg is an amazing resource. So I hope you guys have some good ones. And then we're also gonna try something new today. So we're gonna try a community roundtable session. So for those who are able and want to join us after the 1.15 Pacific Standard Time mark, we're gonna kind of transition into a 30 minute reflection as a group. So we can share takeaways and discuss additional questions um, that arose during the session. And then we'll take those lingering questions and convert them back to Greg. We'll have a space to ask him about them during his really, um, his inaugural, we're kicking off this Ask a Farmer series that's gonna be starting to be hosted on our Instagram live. Um, so the first one is April 2nd at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard. So yeah, that's gonna be the flow for today. Hope you guys are stoked. I'm super excited. Um, just some like quick housekeeping for y'all. So for Zoom best practices, if you head over to Farmer Greg's Zoom screen and you click those right dots, um, those three dots in the upper right hand corner and hit pin, then that'll kind of make his screen, him and Leah's screen bigger for you guys. So it's less distracting with everyone else on the call. Um, and then for questions during questions and answers, we're gonna, we're excited to let you guys just unmute and ask Greg your questions directly. So to do that, you'll just head over to participants. It's on the bottom of the Zoom bar. And then there's a button in there that should say raise hand. So when we transition to Q&A, um, there'll be space to raise your hand and it'll kind of put you in a queue and we'll call on you and you can ask him. Or if you don't want to ask your question, um, you know, or you can't unmute or something, then go ahead and put your question in the chat and we'll do our best to get to some of those as well. 
Um, just one quick note on some guardrails around the questions and answers in a super friendly way, just uh, moderating. Um, we'll give each person about 90 seconds to ask your question. And if you start to go over time, I'll toss the confetti emoji up on the screen so that you know it's about time to kind of like wrap it up. Um, and we'll just all kind of like stay accountable to each other to make sure that we can get through a really good amount of questions in the session. All right, and then Leah and I, um, probably myself, will be just sharing links and resources throughout as it makes sense. So give Leah some love for joining us today. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I, I think actually, um, let's kick things off. So Greg is a first generation farmer and he is extremely well-trained in, I mean, Greg, you've, you've had so many experiences. So throughout being a community organizer, he is the co-founder of Sea and Soil, which is a nonprofit collective um, based in San Diego that's really focusing on repairing ecosystems and community through education, storytelling, and earth stewardship. And then also most recently, he's the creator of 1000 Tiny Farms and he'll tell you all about it, but it's so rad. I have to tell you a little bit now. Um, they're really doing great work there to cultivate a regional network of market gardens. Um, and through that work, exploring the social environment and economic impacts of a small patch of land and the sharing of resources. So what does that mean in local communities around the world? So with that, I'd love to pass it to Leia to give us all a, a quick little visual treat, if you wouldn't mind, Leia. Of course. Um, yeah, I'll just start sharing the video and then we'll go ahead and answer that question. Uh, let's see. Okay, hopefully there's not a lag. We'll try. Let's do full screen. I farm to grow the healthiest produce possible in close proximity to the end consumer. I think that several small scale farms is a really good answer to competing against the agriculture. I'm Greg Reese and I'm a first generation farmer. I'm a small scale farmer. I've helped start many gardens and small farms in Southern California. I focus on not tilling the soil and not using any chemicals or pesticides to promote soil health. Soil health is important because that's where plants get their nutrition from to fight off bugs and diseases and also give us the most nutrition that we can get. We as consumers can demand a standard for our produce to be a certain flavor and a certain quality so that it changes farmers' practices. So I'm trying to mimic nature. I'm trying to mimic how a forest grows, how a jungle grows. There's many species. It's not just one. So we as farmers should try to emulate that and not try to overpower nature and create it like a factory or trying to extract too much. We want to promote as much growth as possible, promote life, biodiversity, give life back to the soil and create a vibrant ecosystem. Biodiversity makes plants more resilient, makes them taste better, and it makes the soil better. I'd like to encourage people to know where your food comes from, purchase from local <clears throat> farmers, grow your own food at your own backyard, growing really nutrient dense, healthy foods with healthy soils should be the least expensive and affordable for everybody. I'm Greg Reese and I'm a first generation farmer. Amazing. Thank you, Leah. Gorgeous, guys. So if anyone, if that, it played perfectly on my side, but if anyone had a little bit of a lag, depending on your internet connectivity, um, that link that I just dropped in the chat is the Greg's Meet a Farmer feature and the video is right at the top of that. So if you want to watch it later, if that didn't work out too well on your side. So awesome. Well, I'm super excited um, to, to really dive in actually to the theme. The theme for our session today is a first generation farmer's perspective on home scale gardening and tiny farms. 
So super exciting to me, especially building off of the John Martin Fortier um, conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago. I think it's a perfect one too. And I know JMF has been an inspiration to you and your work as well, Greg. Um, and I'd really like to encourage as we're, as Greg's gonna start sharing a little bit more about his experiences, um, please just share questions in the chat as things come up. If something that he says sparks a thought, go ahead and drop it in there and we'll try and weave that into the conversation or we can save the question for later. Awesome. All right, Greg. So it sounds like growing up, uh, you know, there was a lot less of farming exposure, agriculture exposure, and it certainly didn't run in your family. So I think it's super amazing to see the road that's taken you to a vision of a thousand tiny farms. I'd love if you could take a few minutes and color in the lines for us of how you got started in this world of agriculture and what were the experiences that led you here? All right. Thanks, Tori. Thanks, Leah. Hey, everybody. Um, pleasure to be here. This is great. So around the theme of how first-generation farmers or how farmers can get started or how to break into this um, realm. For me, personally, I didn't see myself as a farmer when I was growing up, even when I was going to college. Um, and I... It was a it was a series of events that kind of led me down a path, and I just gravitated towards growing food and 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 creating communities. So the reason when I grew up, I grew up in Orange County, which is like Southern California. It's you know concrete jungle. Um, you know, parents weren't farmers, um, weren't really into agriculture or anything like that. Um, but then what when, when I went to college, I was I was I was in business school actually, so I wasn't even thinking about farming. Um, I worked at a restaurant there and I, it was a farm to table restaurant and I had this am amazing salad, which was great. Cause I mean, my whole life I was eating like meat and potatoes and, and, um, just like a high protein diets. And, uh, I had this salad and it was just like, it was amazing. And I taste so good and it had so much flavor and, um, it gave me so much energy. Like I, I just started, you know, I had clean, good energy. Um, so that was initial kind of experience with um, eating really good food, which we'll get to later and kind of leads me down, led me down a path. Um, so it was after, it was after college that I was trying to find my place in the, in, I went to business school. So I was looking for marketing jobs, sales jobs. Um, and I was working in an office a little bit and doing sales um, and realized it was just kind of like about a paycheck and it was more, instead of like a means to an end, it was just more of like, I just need to make some money. And it wasn't really satisfying me at all. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people have been down this realm before where they need their, their um, core values need to align with what they do for work or what they, you know, what they want their life to be. So um, I didn't know how to get started really. Um, I knew at the time we were going through like a really tough drought in Southern California and there was a couple of years of just hardly any rain and, um, it was an economic downturn too, is after the, the, uh, economic crisis, um, in 2009, 2010. And, um, so I just wanted to get involved with, with something. So I look at on, I looked on, um, this website called meetup.com. It's not a, not a dating website or anything. It's a, uh, it's for like organizations and um, people just to gather and do random like hiking or biking or, you know, dancing or whatever together. And there was this one for rainwater harvesting. And I thought that was great. Okay. So we can harvest rainwater. This is like blew my, blew my mind. You're like, all right, so I can capture rainwater, the little rainwater that we get here in Southern California. And, uh, um, and we can use it, use it. So we're saving people money and it's better for the environment. Like it seemed like a win-win for me. So I was like, sign me up. I went on one Saturday just for a couple hours and, um, really enjoyed it. I was out, I was outside, I was digging, I was, I was, you know, making trenches. I was like getting dirty, um, really good core group of people that were, that were working it. Um, it just, the environment felt really good. So I just wanted to have a little more something that, that was the initial spark just to kind of get um, into the sustainability sector, like doing something where my work aligns with my core values, um, of doing something better for the planet or helping out your community. Um, still didn't really know what it, what it meant at the time. Um, but it was cool. Cause I could, it was, it was something, it was something. And at the time also it was like idealistic where 
you're, I was, um, you know, you want to change the world. Like you see like, so many problems with the world and you're like, I want to just, I want to do everything. I'm like, like, I want to do this and solve this problem and solve that problem. And then it was so daunting. And I, I spent time just like, it was not depressing, but it was really just daunting to me. And then I kind of took a step back and said, all right, so in order to change the world or to make a big scale difference, how about I just start with my local community and start with myself, start with my friends, start with like my city and then kind of be an inspiration or be a um, just uh, just leading by example or not even leading, just like doing something. And then maybe it'll inspire others to kind of do the same. And then it kind of just trickles out from there. That was my you know initial idea. So, all right. So <laughs> I'm, so I'm capturing rainwater and then this, all this was the rainwater was great. And we were using the rainwater to, um, grow orchards, grow landscaping and, and vegetable gardens. And, um, I just saw how the plants responded to, I wasn't really into plants at this time either. So I'm, I saw how plants were responding to the rainwater after maintaining the systems for a while, for a couple of years. And just to see the vibrance of, uh, the orange trees, the avocados, the, just everything was just seemed so much happier and had so much flavor. Um, I found my happy place in these orchards that I was just, I was just doing the, the irrigation for them. And I was, and I remember one day looking in under this orange tree and it was just so like vibrant and lush and like, I know it's kind of weird, but I, I did have like a single tear roll down. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> um, so I kind of just wanted to keep going with that. There was another company uh, in San Diego that was installing backyard gardens and uh, I was like, okay, so this, so I was selling rainwater part-time and I was still working at a restaurant part-time. So I wanted to become full-time in the sustainability sector and just took on as many part-time jobs as I could because there was nothing for like a full-time spot. Uh, so I started um, helping out with these rain, um, uh, these gardens and we were growing lots of vegetables and just the immense flavor from those things, similar to what I tasted at the restaurant for the first time. And then I kind of understood, okay, there's something to the flavor of this, these produce of this produce that I haven't seen before. Or you can't really get in the store. And why is that? Um, it was bringing a lot of questions. And then I started my, started my own garden, small, you know, start my own small gardens um yeah let's see so then hopefully i'm not rambling too much everybody we're just uh, kind of going on a story here uh, <laughs> um so this is this is when i started to kind of like get the spark of like growing food uh and i still didn't know i was gonna be a farmer or wanted to farm at this at this point um so getting these these good feelings of growing food and harvesting rainwater being like a, all, all of my actions, my hours were spent doing things that aligned with my core values. So this was important. This was extremely important to me. Um, I was still looking for part-time jobs. I looked on or, uh, growing food. And so I looked on Craigslist. I put out ads. I put up signs in my neighborhood, like girls grow food and let's do, let's start gardens. Um, just whatever I could do. Um, and I still couldn't find like part or uh, full-time uh, work in my air in my area. Um, it's a lot of there's a lot of city in San Diego, obviously, um, and Southern California. So there wasn't there's not big there are farms, but um, I couldn't find anything full time. So this is what led me to another organization called Woofing, or um, I also looked on the company called Work Away, and these are companies that kind of place you with a. Um, Woofing stands for World Organization of Organic Farming, or and what it is is like a it's like a work trade exchange. So you can sign up for a a farm in any part of the world, any any state in Cal in the um, United States or any country around the world. So I kind of wanted to stay in um, in the U.S. or in the U.S., but I wanted to get out of California randomly. Um, so I saw a place in Hawaii and uh, found a spot for a work trade where I was working 25 hours a week in exchange for a room and board. Uh, so I was working like five hour days for five days a week. And uh, I was like, cool, sign me up. If that's, that's the deal, or if I do that, then I can get uh, a place to stay and, a, um, and 
you know, food to eat. So, and I can work and get experience. And also doing this, I wanted to see if I could farm full time or if I could really, uh, yeah, be a full time farmer, like working outside every day uh, in the rain, in the heat, in the cold, or whatever, whatever in the elements. Um, so I just wanted to, it was a test to see if I could really do this. And this was like a low, um, low risk um, endeavor because it didn't cost anything to me. And, um, and it just provided me with a good opportunity to work full time and, and to live on site, like live on the farm, which was great. Uh, that was something also that, that seemed to be really cool just to work, work and live on a farm. I was like, yeah. And I, the surf was close by or like the ocean's close by and jungles are close by. So I was, this is, this is great. Um, so yeah, then I went to Hawaii, worked on a tropical fruit farm for about a year. Um, we, we, it was 20 acres. We, we planted lots of cacao and coffee. There was already existing avocado and citrus and papaya, banana. Um, and it was, there was, I lived on two different ones. One was like a little commune. There was probably like 20 people living there. So it was, we were eating together and like, we were working together and like the vibe was great. And we'd have like big dinners and, you know, it was, it was fantastic. I was like, this is, how can we, why did, why did, is this not like a mainstream thing? Or maybe it was like in the sixties or something, but, um, so this was great. And, uh, so I was getting, getting experience working and like I said, it was like 25 hour minimum. Uh, but I wanted to do more. I was like, why don't you guys, I would talk to the farm, the farm owners, the farm managers. And I was like, why don't you just, I'll keep working. Um, just want to learn more and keep doing it. And eventually they hired me as like a farm manager. Cause I just showed initiative and I really liked it. Um, Maybe that's, maybe that's why I guess they kept hiring me, but, um, so I did that for about a year and then, uh, then I, you know, I'm not from Hawaii. It was great, but, um, uh, California, I, I came back to visit California for a friend's wedding. And I was like, this is just so nice. I need to be, I need to be here in California. It's like where my home is, where my family is. Um, so then I took all the experience that I, learn from harvesting rainwater and and growing orchards and vegetable gardens and then the farming in Hawaii and I was like let's do that in Southern California let's have like let's set up shop let's grow some roots literally figuratively um let's plant some roots in Southern California and make it happen so um still couldn't find full-time jobs uh in farming really um, but then I looked on Craigslist, I found a company that set up backyard gardens, um, and, and then a school garden where that was, uh, they were both hiring part-time. So this, so now I was back in California, I was hiring, or I was setting up backyard gardens part-time and then doing a school garden part-time. So with both of those, it was, you know, over 40, 50 hours a week. And then now I'm like a full-time farmer, but I had two different jobs, but I'm like a full-time farmer or somewhat, um, or I'm just full-time in agriculture at least. So, uh, so then I did that for like another, a full, a full year or so. And, um, and it was great. I could dive into the things of, um, you know, school gardens and like teaching kids and, and that's fan. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, never really been around kids before either. Um, never, never taught, um, never taught anything, never like was a teacher or anything like that. So, um, it was a really humbling experience and just like you have to break everything down and they are so observant and they're so, um, little sponges, obviously, you know, and they take everything you say with like, they're, they're really attentive and then would notice like little bugs or little weeds, like the things that I would never notice. So that was really cool. Um, and okay. So that at this time I'm, I'm installing, uh, gardens and, and doing that. And these are, this is great, but the thing is um when you're installing small scale gardens it's great for the homeowner um but even for them that's not they're not eating like 100 percent from their garden they're eating you know not even 25 percent. they're eating like just maybe 10 percent. so it's a small these like small gardens were a great idea and they're creating good food so so i was just daunted and say like how can we scale this up or how can i make this a little bit bigger but not but still have the flavor and the nutrition without um but but on a bigger scale in the cities uh so that led me to market gardening and and i just found a lot of things on youtube honestly that was my first uh, inspiration so there's guys from john martin Fortier, the market gardener 
Um, this guy named Curtis Stone, he's a urban farmer in, in Canada also. I took his course, I took a, like a weekend course um, down here in, so in Southern California, which is great. Um, guys like Never Sync Tools and my friend uh, Steven from Nature's Always Right, he's a really good resource. He's in San Diego, so we bounce ideas off um, each other. And then, uh, so yeah, this guy, Steven um, from Nature's Always Right, I was reaching out to him saying like, hey, where, where can we get full-time jobs? Where can, how can we scale up this, um, this uh, vegetable production without having like big tractors or I don't have, I don't own land. I don't um, have any, I don't have a tractor or anything like that. So like, how can I get started? Um, he let, uh, introduced me to a, um, uh, close friends still, uh, Marcos Mujica, and um, we he, he hired me as a as a farm manager um, for a nonprofit doing these small scale. They call it lean farming or market gardening. It's just growing a lot of food in a small space, um, still with ecological practices. So I'm not. I've never been certified organic. Um, I my practices. I've never used a chemical or a pesticide in my life or an herbicide. Um, so, uh, and I don't till because I don't have a tractor. So it's like all these things kind of aligned and like the, the quality of produce that was coming out was unlike anything I've ever seen. And it wasn't just, it wasn't me. It's just like you set up these elements of good organic uh, compost manure and, and sand and, um, you know, wood chips and things and mulches and these, just the, the, the volume, the quality of produce was just so, so good that I just had to keep it going and, and, um, keep, I don't know, get, getting bigger. <laughs> Great. Right. I'd love to, yeah. this is amazing. Thank you so, so much. I want to underscore something that Andrea Lewis just put in the chat that she's tried to contact several farms in her area, in her state and other surrounding states. And I am pulling that thread out of your story as a theme of how challenging it is if, you don't have friends or family or mentors within the farming community. Like how does someone really, you know, get started? It's like you, you were such a self-starter all the way through, like between Craigslist and Woofing and like really seeking it out. Um, and also I just love the piece that you talked about that feeling in, of community in your time in Hawaii and, you know, how that transforms a space when there's people who are actively engaged in not only the growing of the food, but like the sharing and eating and connection around it, like that village, mentality that can come out. And I feel like I see that a lot um, in your in your project, uh, Sea and Soil, as well as a thousand tiny farms. So I'd love if, I know there's probably maybe a little more in between now and there. So if you want to backfill, feel free, but I'd love to hear about, about these amazing programs that you're a part of and creator of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe starting with, um, Andrea had also issues of contacting farms and no Contacting farms or how to, oh, no one responding. Um, well, actually, one thing that I, I did do was um, I went to the farmer's market. So that's where you could actually find farmers or find people that grew food. So you go there, ask them some questions, um, see if they need help, see if they do volunteering, um, see if there's other farms in your area, like um, Google search, obviously, see if anybody's doing any volunteering. And that's like a, another step. But for anybody just starting out, like, try to grow, to see if it's good for you, try to grow some food and your patio and your backyard, whatever kind of space you have, if there's a little bit of sunlight and it could be a, you know, a really small patio, it could be um, just a front porch, you know, um, or you could have a backyard, or you could have a lot of acreage. Um, I would just say, get started somewhere, either growing in, in little pots or in a shoebox, or like, honestly, on the story here, my first garden was a friend's bed frame. He was throwing it out. And so it was a perfect like queen size mattress bed frame. And it was just like this perfect rectangle that was, you know, a foot tall. And it was just like repurposing. It was just like, why don't we just make that into a raised bed? Why don't we put soil in there and grow some food? Um, this guy, Ron Finley in, in um, Long Beach, he was an initial inspiration too. He was like, yeah, he's, they call him the gorilla gardener. So he's like, let's just grow food wherever we can grow food in like in empty lots in the easements, like in where there's sidewalk or there's no sidewalk. It's just like public, just if you can find a spot to do it, just, uh, it's better to 
do now and ask questions later. Like instead of instead of like having the analysis paralysis thing about like how do I how do I garden or how do I farm or how do I do this? Just just do something and then you kind of figure it out as you go. Because you the good thing about gardening and farming is that you start to be really you start to pay really close attention to what the plant how the plants are responding. Um, if they're per if they're you know perked up, if they're kind of droopy, if the you can look at the soil, it gets you really connected with um with natural settings. Uh so that would be my first advice to anybody just trying to start is it's literally just like make that leap and put some soil into a pot or a box or a cardboard box or something or crates. Um, uh, yeah, and if you're not sure about soil, um, that's okay. Cause it's, it took me a while to kind of understand what good soil is and how, so also as farmers and gardeners, we're not, yes, we are growing plants and yes, we want plants, but it took me a while to also realize that we're just literally cultivating soil, like making the great soil conditions. And then the plants are a byproduct. So it's not where you don't have to focus on the plant necessarily, you have to focus on the soil. Because the soil is where the plants get gets all its nutrition and that's where all the life is. And we don't, we don't obviously don't see it, it's underground. So it's a it's a universe of of uh there's so much biology down there. Anyways, so if you don't have any soil, just see if you can dig something up in a random yard or go to your local hardware store and buy some potting mix or pot, pot, potting soil. And I will say that all potting soil is not created equal. A lot of these, um, it's okay to, for your first time to use something from hardware store, um, totally okay. The issues with that are that sometimes those are things called like filler. We call, you know, as a gardener or farmer, the things that hardware stores sell you are just like fillers where it looks like soil and it has kind of the elements of soil, which is like broken down uh, wood chips, they call that humus um, or broken down organic matter. The, the thing that these, some of the hardware stores are lacking is that is the soil biology. So if you have that filler, that's a good, um, good filler. So it's like holding the space, but it needs to be, it needs to have biology in order, in order to grow plants. So one common thing that maybe that people don't understand is that the importance of biology in the production of plants. So when I go back to saying it's all about the soil, when the soil has a has an incredible food web, and you see worms, they're at the, kind of the top of that food web of, in the soil, as far as like a macro biology. Um, so, and, sorry, I'm kind of going off on tangents here. Good soil, so with comp I mean, compost. Good soil, yeah, composted um, manures, chick manure, horse manure, uh, cow manures are really good. Uh, so good soil is a combination of that humic, uh, material, like I said, is decomposed organic matter, meaning decomposed wood chips, decomposed um, grass clippings, green materials, other plants. That breaks down. Um, and that's breaking down because bugs are eating it. Bugs are eating it and breaking it down. And that's a good thing. We think of bugs as being a bad thing, but there's w much more good bugs than bad bugs. I'll leave that's a different tangent. When you see bugs on your on your plants, it's not you're not trying to um, instead of trying to kill the pest or kill the bug on your plant, you want to first look at your soil because if plants are stressed, they're going to send off signals to pests and bugs saying, "Hey, come eat me! I'm I'm sick! I'm dying!" And the, this is a natural process of of nature. So, uh, all right, sorry, tangents. No, it's great. Um, yeah, so soil is a mixture of humic, uh, humic, uh, material with a little bit of sand because sand helps bind it also create some drainage and, um, and then the biology. So you can have, there's biological inoculants, but if you don't want to do that way, that's totally, that's totally fine. Um, I would do is just start your own kind of worm bin or, um, with your veggie scraps that you have from your kitchen. Worm bins are, are great. Uh, a great way to start. And if you don't know where to get any worms, um, honestly, the first time I got worms, I went to the local bait shop, got some night crawlers and I bought some, I bought a bunch of worms and just threw them in my, 
compost bin that had all my veggie scraps. If you don't have one of those close by, just put down some cardboard on some grass or like on a on dirt and wet it down and they will come, the, the worms will come running and they love to eat that, um, all that cardboard in that moist area. <laughs> Okay. Can we transition? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Paul's asking and Tori was asking about Thousand Tiny Farms yeah. and Seen Soil and just yeah. kind of your vision for the future in terms of small scale farms, farms collaborating and what that network looks like and the benefits there. Yeah. Okay. So I went and I worked at a Mar garden. Um, it was three acres and it's called Sage Hill Ranch Gardens in Escondido. It's awesome people. Um, still talk with them all the time huge inspiration, great mentors. Um, so it was a three acre farm and we we're pumping out produce. Like we we're just like, it's gold. There's, it's beyond organic. It's a uh, extremely, the produce is just awesome. And it's on this small scale and in, you know, three acres with maybe like an acre of it cultivated. Um, and I was saying, if we can produce this much on in one small farm, what, how can we create more of these small farms that are doing the same practices? And, and could that be a way to literally feed your community and um, have some resilience against any big distribution companies or big agriculture companies? And there's nothing wrong with big ag companies. And, and it's just that I'm focused on quality of the produce. And for me, um, freshness and time of harvest the, the time from harvest to the end consumer is incredibly important because the nutrients obviously start to deteriorate after harvest with most things some things ripen up after you after you uh pick them that's fine um so the vision with thousand tiny farmers like all right so if we can create several small scale farms in a community or in a city or in a county um that could be a good answer to um to literally feeding people incredibly nutrient dense, fresh food. And in my eyes, my thoughts were the only way that we can do this is with, you know, 10 or 20 or a thousand. So this, this phrase, I started, I started creating all these small scale farms. And then this like idea just popped in. I'm just creating a thousand of these tiny farms. And then my friend's like thousand tiny farms, let's do it. Let's start it. Let's keep it going. And that's where it kind of was, was birthed. And um, it's, it was in response to also, I was working at this at Sage Hill um, during COVID, during the first, um, uh, and we, we saw a big disruption in um, supply chain from big agriculture companies. Uh, then there's like, there's wholesalers or there's distributors and there's packaging facilities. And um, I saw, obviously we all saw, um, food like shelves and grocery stores being empty. And at the time I was like, I was just growing all this food. I had too much, too much food that we, um, there was too much food to be produced on this small scale. So it was just natural to say like, why don't we just keep making more of these small scale farms? We'll create community, we'll create jobs. People are obviously, you know, getting, we're out of work at that time. Um, so for me, it hit all the, all the marks of nutrient dense food, extremely fresh, extremely nutritious. So that boosts your immune system, which in this time of, of COVID, everybody was, you know, immune systems were compromised. So it's like, the be instead of uh, trying to get a, a cure or a, um, you know, a vaccine, it's like, why don't we, instead of trying to cure the, the disease, just like how with, so with soil and pests, just, instead of trying to cure the disease, why don't we try to prevent the disease from even happening? And so we have to have like a good foundation um, for our human bodies to create a good immune system. And there's a couple of things in my opinion is um, extremely nutrient dense food. That's, that's a um, huge. And then also like being outside exercising and then having a sense of community around you. Cause as humans, we just love to talk and converge. And I think that, that we're extremely healthy when we, when we talk to our neighbors and talk to our friends and eat together and um, like all these neurons are firing. So we're like, this is, the, that's the healthiest way. That's the healthiest human beings we can, we can um, be. And it was just kind of 
interesting to me that nobody was talking about this. Everyone was talking about vaccine and, and cures. And um, I was like, why don't we just try to prevent it from even happening? And it like blew my mind that that's exactly how we took care of the soil. It's like, if you see a pest, then you go back to the root cause of it saying, all right, and you look at the soil. What's wrong? What am I, what's wrong with the soil that, it, um, why doesn't it have enough nutrition for this plant to be healthy? The same thing for humans. It's like, what's, if I'm going to, then I need to eat, really, I need to eat something. So, <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I, I love where you're headed with this. And I'm, I'm like half on my phone, half on the other. So let me know if you guys sure. can't hear me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I love where you're headed with this. And I, I cut out for just a quick sec, but I think what you're talking to that piece of community is so important. And we're getting so many head nods when you're talking about like the proactive nature of nutrient dense food, being outside a sense of community. Um, tell us about CN Soil. Leah is also a co-founder of this amazing initiative. And I'd love for you guys to take a beat and like tell us how CN Soil, the nonprofit is filling that gap and that void between community and you know how that healing can come about by just entering into that space of land stewardship through community. I'm gonna yes, start yeah, off. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, CN Soil is our little side passion project. Uh, it's in the process of becoming a 501c3, but really how it started with my, my best friend, Lex Weinstein, it, we just, as surfers, we're all surfers here and you know, we thought there's a responsibility that surfers should be pioneering the environmental movement and be really, you know, stewarding not only our oceans, but also our lands, because there's a really big connection, right, between the sea and the soil. And so we started a little garden club for surfers that was, let's just get surfers into the garden and have them start farming and gardening. And so it started with this little tiny seed, and we just gathered a few of our friends. This was, gosh, almost two years ago now. Um, and we went to a local farm here at the Ecology Center, and we had about 15 friends who showed up, and we couldn't believe all our surfer friends were interested to garden. And we had so much fun, and it was it was just such a powerful experience, again, to gather in community and have that garden be the center place that we're gathering in. So we would garden, uh, volunteer at that farm, and then go and surf together. So we were barefoot in the soil and then barefoot in the sea. And then we hosted another one the next month and we made it more public and we had 30 people. So it doubled in attendance. And then the following month we did it and we did it at the Kumayai San Pasqual Reservation here, which is a bit inland. And we ended up having triple. So every time it just doubled in attendance. We're like, wow, people are really into this. It's catching on. And so there was like 75 people who showed up at that third one and we ended up planting 750 edible native fire resistant drought tolerant plants on the reservation with the community and then we also invited the youth from the reservation to come out and surf and these are children who live an hour away from the ocean but don't have access um they've never been to the beach some of them and so to be able to to take them surfing for the first time and and just get them comfortable in the ocean and then go back and plant with them um, food that will last for generations, hopefully, um, was where Sea and Soil then was officially birthed as a program. And so, and then Greg coming into the mix with a thousand tiny farms, it was just such a perfect segue for really the people to, you know, we can, hone, that's our program to hone in on the, the farming part and how to, you know, inform aspiring farmers with the tools they need to start their own, whether it's a home garden or a tiny farm, and really create this movement to just get as many people gardening and farming, just like the Victory Garden movement, you know, let's bring that back. And so what started as a passion from a few surfers to just take care of our ocean, we saw the connection with the land, and here we are with sea and soil. So we're officially launching on Earth Day next month. So um, we just launched our website, seeandsoil.org. But yeah, a lot of exciting things happening there. But I think the premise of it all really is building community um, and just gathering together to help steward the land. And that gives health and vitality to us too. So I don't know yeah. if you have anything to add. <laughs> um, so we're also trying to create these market gardens or these really high productive um, market gardens or, or farms in um, 
communities that usually do either don't have access to these um, types of produce or can't afford it. Um, also, in my opinion, that this type of food um, shouldn't be extremely expensive. It should be really affordable because if you're growing it in your area, uh, it's doesn't need to go through dis distribution channel or sale or um, store like sales avenues. So it can be really affordable and really nutrient dense in places that uh, really need it the most. That would be, uh, okay. yeah. So then Thousand, Thousand Tiny Farms is now a pro uh, program of sea and soil. Yeah, so he has his first three and more farms, but um, the backyard Carlsbad, if you've seen the images, it's and in the video, that aerial, the drone shot with all the long 50 foot rows, that was in his backyard in Carlsbad. And then we started at our friend's plot of land. He's our designer for sea and soil and he just had an empty backyard and Greg's like, we have to farm this. So we just kind of like self-funded and gathered resources and Greg basically single-handedly with some of our friends helped um, build that. And yeah, we want to get that to um, chronically ill. They're med mm -hmm. medically tailored mm -hmm. meals through Mama's Kitchen, which is a nonprofit out here that um, buys food from farmers and then cooks them and gives them to chronically ill patients. Um, and then the reservation, is the third tiny farm working on working with them um and and beyond that but really it's it's not just about that it's to spread that movement so if you guys have a garden or tiny farm where you're at what you're working on send it our way you can send it to the thousand tiny farms instagram or email us um and we would love to just share and profile because i think just the more buzz there is the more inspiration and people you know seeing other people doing this then it makes it easier to start <laughs> yeah. back to your theme of yeah. starting. Yeah, it's, more of a movement. Go ahead. it's more of a movement. It's just, uh, it's not like a company necessarily. It's just, you know, it's called action saying, um, grow, grow food in your area, grow food in empty lots. Um, and not just the garden, like let's start with that. Yes. But let's make it a little bit bigger. Let's like, let's how much can we push the envelope a little bit to really make a difference. And then that's gonna that's the tricky part is like how do we connect all these either uh, how do we connect farms together or how do we share resources either um, just sharing techniques or um, sharing seeds sharing distribution channels um, sh sharing tools you know I think that's a way for people for uh, these small farms to be really uh, resilient absolutely and I have to. I have to commend you um, before I before I share this. We'll share it. Thank you, Leo, for sending that. We'll send. Um, we'll put up a slide at the end that'll have all the links and ways to contact and reach out Greg um, for a thousand tiny farms as well as the Sea and Soil Initiative. Um, so hang tight on that, and I'll share a few as we transition to questions and answers. So I'd love to invite everyone again, either preferably, I mean, go to participants and then raise your hand, and we'll we'll tee up some questions for for Greg and or Leah um, about Sea and Soil. Um, and we have a few that came through the chat as well. So I'll, I'll just wait a beat and just for one sec, just say, I, I'm so amazed constantly talking to farmers. Um, you guys hold so much. Like we don't ask nurses to do anything but be nurses. And we don't ask moms to be any, I mean, moms are superheroes. We all know this, that's a bad example, but <laughs> more of the story, like most people that have, you know, jobs, they, they went to school, they got a skill set, and they do that niche thing. And of course there's some you know variability in their in their workflow but farmers i think they're marketers and they're salesmen and they are community organizers and you're an entrepreneur in the truest sense and there are so many jobs that fall beneath your main title um that i think it's it's just so beautiful to hear also that even beyond that there's projects that you're working on that are working to bridge community community and consumers to the work that farmers do and to shed light on you know how hard it is to become a farmer and to find your way into this world. Um, and then once you're here, there's a lot to hold. So kudos to you, Greg, for, for holding that space and for finding your way. Um, and thank you for sharing it with us today. So we've got a few questions coming in. The first one is, I'll start with Sean. Um, in the garden, what vegetable plants do you think work really well together? Hmm. There's a, there's a couple, couple things about that. So some things can be really good as far as companion planting for flavor and some things can be really good as companion planting for nutrients. 
So for example, and, and like aesthetics and, and um, production. So one that comes to mind, well, I'll do two. So there's tomatoes and basil, and then there's also corn, beans, and squash. So corn, beans, and squash is a very uh, old technique, um, Native American, indigenous, and probably going on for thousands of years. Um, the idea, so beans are nitrogen fixing, which means that they take nitrogen, um, nitrous gas out of the air and fix it into the ground into a form that other plants can use as is essentially like fertilizer. So instead of fertilizing your plants, you can just plant beans and then that will help uh, bring nitrogen and, and help plants grow. So anyways, so you plant corn, beans, and squash together. Um, they all, um, they're all very, uh, uh, let's say, they, they work so well together because squash vines along the ground. So like spaghetti squash, butternut squash, um, pumpkins, even watermelon. Uh, it's, it's a vine that covers the ground. And what this does is creates like a, a mulch layer, meaning it shades the ground and it keeps the moisture in the soil. Beans, like I said, fix nitrogen and they grow up They're They're like pole beans grow up. And so they need something to trellis on like a, and that's where your corn comes in. So if you plant corn and that grows up six feet tall, your bean is right next to it, feeding it nitrogen and growing up on top of it. And then you have your squash next underneath covering, blanketing the whole, all three, uh, the surface of, of the other two. So those are working in tangent together and each one serves a purpose to benefit the other. So that's a great, that's a great one as far as um, purpose. Uh, flavor wise, I really like to plant um, tomatoes and uh, basil together. Um, that's kind of kind of obvious in culinary. Um, obviously, we have tomato sauces and basil together, and uh, but for it's really interesting that the flavors seem to pop even more when you plant them right next to each other, and not only and, and then pollinators. So that's another whole thing. So if a basil flower starts to starts to flower and tracks bees and other pollinators, which then will pollinate the tomatoes. Um, well, the bees and butterflies and other flying insects will come and pollinate. They are land on the basil and then they will keep flying around that area and then land on, to, on a uh, tomato flower as well, since it's in close proximity. Hmm. Um, so those help each other as far as pollinating each other. And um, also with flavor, it just seems to be for some reason, it just seems to the tomatoes seem to be a way tastier and juicier when you plant them. Yeah. And then, so poll pollinators is another thing. You plant pollinator does another. Um, that's another like companion plant. As a quick follow up, um, where is it? Aaron's curious. What's the best kind of trellis for tomatoes? Since mm. we're talking about tomatoes, anyways. Yeah. So that could be in a couple of things. Um, if you have one tomato use um you can use a cage um there's this really cool trellis i think it's called texas cage company and it, it's it's these like you know 18 inch round uh and they and it collapses so that's um those are really those are really cool but if you don't have that then um is that for bigger scale that's that's for like small scale gardens so it's like one or two plants but if you're doing like 20 or 50 or 10 plants um, like in a single row, um, the easiest thing to do as far as cost effective is called the Florida weave. And what that is, is just a series of fence posts in a straight line. And then you take, uh, uh, so you put those every six feet or every eight feet, um, slam them in the ground. And then you take a yarn or twine of some sort. And uh, you go on, on one side of the um, trellis it's kind of hard to explain but it's like this and you kind of wrap the twine around the post and then go to the next one and wrap it around the post and the next one and you do that on the top of the post and then about a foot down and another foot down and pretty soon you have this like um you have these like ropes that are just like hanging and then the as as the tomato plant grows up in there it just holds onto those ropes and it can really um it's really easy and really cost effective so it's called the florida weave if you want to check that one out is this a good photo? That's a that's that's a technique. Oh yeah, sorry. There's other techniques. I can share that one second. So I any pole, any pole or any fence, it'll grow along. 
Um, and it's pretty much made is that you don't need to trellis them. Like if you have the space, they grow on the ground, they vine on the ground, they're a bush. You know, we, as they'll produce more and it's easier to harvest when you put them on a trellis. But if you're in a home garden or if in your backyard space, you do not need a trellis. You can just plant it in the ground. And what it does, if you've ever grown tomatoes before, it vines along the ground and then it sends roots down. Vines along the ground and sends roots down. So it, it'll literally just bush out and it'll send roots all over. The only thing with that is you, you walk in there and you have to like, you know, pick your tomatoes and you might step on a plant or two, but that's that's okay if you're just a home gardener. Um, <laughs> we only do the trellises for uh, like high production because it's just easier to harvest and easier to prune. That's all. Amazing. Greg, we're getting a ton of technical questions and also a few more narrative questions. So I want to save maybe the technical questions till the end. Um, those are perfect if you guys can make the Ask a Farmer on April 2nd. That's like the best time. To, it's just like Greg in the garden, like with all of his technical knowledge. So I love that. And I'd like to bump up Marielle or Marielle. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but she asked a beautiful question that I'd love to get your thoughts on, Greg. Um, and it says, do you know any programs that connect new farmers with accessing or purchasing land? Prices in California are at an all time high. And I find it discouraging trying to figure out how to afford a small parcel of land to start a small scale regenerative farm operation. Yeah, one that I have used before and reached out is in California, actually. So it's called California Farm Link, and I think they have them in every state. Uh, so cafarmlink.com. Uh, yeah, it's California Farm Link. And these are um, listings of property where um, they're farm properties or it's farm owners that are looking for farm managers or for someone to help out their lease or just someone to buy their farm or to rent out like a section of their farm. So that's a great one. Um, and then I looked on as far as like empty, empty plots. Um, I, I looked on Zillow for just like, just, and just a lot, you know, like what, where are empty lots in for sale? So I looked on, on Zillow one time for, for plots. Um, where else? We can There's think the, about uh, Oh, urban agriculture, urban, urban agri zone. It's like B A I Z. Um, that's a company that is trying to find these little plots and um, and rent them out to people that want to produce or do agriculture in urban areas. Amazing. I can't. Find oh, sorry. Uh, they, they might, they might uh, be just. I know it's a I know it's a California initiative. I know they're doing it in Los Angeles and, and San Francisco and uh, right. just, started, just started in San Diego, but okay, we're cool. trying to push the narrative to be able to have a little bit more. Right on. I will, I'll pick it up later and then share that out in the, in the show notes or however we want to go through that. Um, got a really amazing question from Mario. Can you speak on the challenges of local distribution and the challenges of making a living off of farming? So distribution and what's it like to make a living off of farming? Yeah, distribution is a is a is a challenge. Um, you either have to do it yourself, or um, like you have to get a van and and try to and do it yourself. And one of the other narratives I'm trying to get to is trying to bring people to the farm. So instead of packing everything up and and deli and delivering, I try to bring people to the farm. If that's not an option, I've just reached out to other distribution. Um, Channels in my area, uh, and I don't know how I where, where I found these guys, but um, well, you usually just show up at the restaurant or the market and just bring produce and see if they're interested. Yeah, yeah, I've gone. I've just done my own distribution, honestly, and uh, I I load up a truck or a van and and deliver. Um, I've had people come and pick up. Uh, larger orders and that's been pretty cool and there there's been other things with um like almost like grubhub or um uber eats people will deliver they will come pick up your food and deliver and they'll pick up like a vegetable box and then deliver it to um to a set house uh the other thing we can do with like csa boxes is finding a hub so there's like churches or any, anything um, in your area 
but CSA hubs are, are a really cool idea. So if you're not doing a distribution, at least you can make some boxes and then bring those boxes to um, a centralized location. Um, man, I have to, and then making a living on farming is just like setting your price for, oh man, it's tough because everybody's different. So I'm just, a, I'm a vegetable farmer. Well, I can, um, I look at other market value, other market price, see what my input costs are. And I have to, hopefully I'm setting my own price and not um, being a price taker where I just, if someone offers me a, uh, a price, then and it may not make sense to me. So I have to like set my own prices to make sure that it, that it makes financial sense to me based on all your inputs and all your other costs. Yeah, not, e not easy, definitely not. I see. I've been having this conversation with friends around entrepreneurs, artists, creative, um, that exchange of reciprocity between what is the value that I want to place on my work and knowing how to charge enough, but also keep it accessible and affordable to the community that you want to serve. So feel you on that fine line and balancing that. Mm -hmm. One other, one other cool thing or good thing, um, with some of the practices that I farm, like it's an advantage and disadvantage. I don't own any farmland. I'm either leasing farmland or I have a, have a um, agreement with the homeowners to farm on their land in exchange for vegetables, let's say. So in my opinion, I don't think farmland, especially in California, is um, incongruent or with a price of produce. Um, like far, uh, land is too expensive here to charge people if I was to charge people like $10 for a head of lettuce or something, they would think I'm crazy, but that's like what it would take in order to make rent on, on my farm. So one strategy is instead of owning land and having a big mortgage is just leasing land or working with the homeowners to uh, have as little rent as possible or a little lease, uh, as little lease amount as possible so that you can, um, still make some money off your off your produce amazing that makes sense i didn't realize kind of that that nuance between leasing and owning i think land ownership especially for beginning farmers is such a i definitely need to know more about it and i think there's definitely a lot of curiosity in the community um allison has a great question allison i dig this question i'm also really curious about this um she's really interested in hearing more about how you're able to grow so much produce on three acres which is such a small space yeah so there's farm seeds in the farming we call it lean farming or style um like in technical aspects i do 30 inch rows so like 30 inches wide and they can be however long as you need 25 feet long 50 feet long usually in 50 to, uh, foot increments is really good it helps with um because irrigation um lengths that they're set in 100 feet or 200 feet so we do 30 inch wide beds because from either side there's no tractor so from either side of the of that 30 i can i can reach from to the other without having to like bend over or get around or or hop to the other side so I'm able to both sides. Uh, then the walkways are small. So the walkways are about 12 inches wide. Um, tractor tires are maybe a little bit wider. So there's just um, a lot with not, nothing bad about, about tractors, but it's just in when you have small spaces, you need to utilize every single spot that you have. Um, so that's part of uh, succession planting and also planting very densely uh, in, in those 30 inch wide beds. And each crop is different. <clears throat> so for example, um, I use a lot of um, salad mix and these are varieties that are we call cut and come again. So it's lettuce, arugula, spinach, uh, baby kale, and I can plant those extremely densely about an, like I put a seed about an inch apart if, with like a, with a cedar. Uh, so these plants are literally like one inch apart or inch and a half apart. And it's growing so dense um, and when the plants get about six inches tall or eight inches tall, I cut about six inches off and I have a full harvest um, for one whole bed. And I'm not pulling any of those roots out or anything. I just, if you leave that 
kale there, that lettuce there, it will come back. So it's called a cut and come again, meaning you cut like half of the plant off and then in a week or two that will all grow back again and then you're cut it again and then so it's just it's like a continuous um it's a continuous crop and the flavor gets a little um can get a little more bitter after like the third or fourth or fifth cut but that's not not always true um the celery technique is great too yeah so then different things about so for example celery um we all have celery that uh we've we've cut or we've bought in the grocery store it's usually cut at the base and you get a full um you know stock with maybe like eight or ten different um celery uh, sticks on there but instead of, and what they're doing is they cut the entire plant and then they sell the entire plant so instead of doing that as the celery grows i just peel the outsides of the stock so you peel maybe like three or four um sticks of celery per plant and um is the new growth comes from the middle and then the old growth is kind of towards the outside, just like kale, just like broccoli, just like, uh, so I take the outside celeries, two or three from each plant. So you're not destroying the entire plant. Uh, then you bind them up and you make a full celery um, bundle um, without killing the plant. And then what that does is that celery is continuously still growing. So the next week I'll go back and have the same yields. So instead of like cutting the entire plant, you uh, have these crops called continuous crops or, or cut and come again varieties. And that, that helps um, with, your, with your yields. I also plant really densely. Um, some people, or like even on your, if you buy a plant, it says have 24 inch spacing or have 36 inch spacing or have 18 inch spacing. Like I'm, I do like things at six inch spacing or, you know, a couple inches. It's just, you don't need to thin things out, but, um, you could just you can pack a lot more in an area than than what is suggested on a uh, on a um, planting packet or on your on your seed um, like on the directions. So that's this is why we need you. We need you to help us read between the lines on the seed packets. I love it. <laughs> I learned those. I learned those things from John Martin Fortier, the market gardener, and mm -hmm. Curtis Stone. They're just like pack it in there, and um, they will grow. So it's and they're right. So it's so yeah, ah. pack it pack it in there. <laughs> pack it in, pack it in the plants. Yeah. Um, all right, amazing. So I want to, we're still getting so many more questions coming in, guys. I'm so excited for Greg to answer these. And um, we're also going to stick around after the session for 30 minutes or so. We'll hold the Zoom room open so we can kind of ask each other some of these questions too. Maybe there's some other gardening, master gardeners in the group that can help out. Um, but in the meantime, dropping all of Greg's amazing ways to support his work. And then I'm just going to share my screen really quickly um, so y'all can see. Oops. Sorry. Gorgeous. So these are great ways to continue connecting with Farmer's Footprint. We are hosting a community chat, um, which I'll drop the link in there. Um, on April, oh my gosh, sorry, I'm forgetting the date and I have my screen shared, so I don't want to <laughs> share it, but it's on April 7th, actually at 12 PM Pacific standard. So that's an upcoming, if you enjoyed this session, um, we have another farm side chat on April 7th at noon. It's with the force of nature group, their regenerative meat and ranching company. So definitely check that out, follow along with us here and way more importantly, support Greg and his efforts here. Um, this is, it's just been an amazing session, Greg. I just have to thank you for, for your time and your generosity and for showing up and, and sharing your technical and life experience with us. I think it's such an important and impactful and powerful story that you have, how you started from, you know, probably a lot of people on these calls don't come from an agricultural background and to see how you can go from ground zero to centering your life around this work and building community in such a beautiful way, I think is, for me, just one of the most exciting things to see the potential that's really possible for every single one of us here. So huge thank you. I know that as a farmer and as a community organizer, you have so many different directions that your attention is pulled a million miles a day, I'm sure. So to spend some time with us just really means a lot. And I really appreciate your time as well as you, Leah. Thanks for jumping in and telling us more about sea and soil. Um, this was a super fun session. And so um, I wanted to also 
yeah, just thank everyone else for being here. Thank you for, for jumping in. And as we said earlier, just the uh, the power of hearing each other's stories, I think is so beautiful. So if there's any, I want to just share one more moment, Greg, if there's a, any final piece that you'd like to, you'd like to leave us with, like, is there anything that you'd like, a final message that you want to imprint on this group as they walk away from this session? Well, man, um, well, obviously, you know, grow your own food, uh, try to get it, get it started. If you're already doing that, um, plant more and keep getting outside, encourage other people to do the same. Um, uh, you can feel free to ask me any questions. I can, I'll, I'll try to help as everybody's different in their own. So things that you read sometimes won't be, you need to know what's going on in climate in your own, uh, area because, um, things, you, the famous thing is read books and study nature. And when the two don't agree, throw out the books. <laughs> nice. I love that. What a quote. Read books, study nature, throw out the books when nature prevails. Gorgeous. Great. Thank you so much for coming with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you guys. And don't forget, yeah, so uh, the After Farmer Fridays will be bi-weekly. So starting next Friday and every other Friday, Greg will be hopping on Farmer's Footprint Instagram live. Um, and you can just drop in questions there. And, and there's no silly questions. Beginner, advanced, all questions, small, big. Um, so keep the conversations there. And he's also in Mighty Networks if you want to connect with him personally. So yeah, awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, we're going to hold the room open for everyone else. So feel free to stick around. And there's going to be a moment, actually. Yeah, they hopped off. Okay, perfect. So there's going to be a moment of um, I'll allow, I'm going to click a button, I think, and it's going to maybe unmute everyone, or maybe I can get everyone to allow themselves to unmute. Um, so let's try that. Allison, can you try and unmute? Allison Kennedy. If possible. Yeah. Yep. You can unmute yourself. You can. Okay, great. Okay, so it works. So <laughs> everyone should be able to unmute now. And this is kind of the transition moment. So this is a total experiment. I'm excited to to do this with you guys. But I think after we had a farm side chat last week with Daniel Griffith. I don't know if anyone got a chance to catch that. Um, but it just felt like after that session, which highly recommend watching the replay if you didn't, people that was like one of the everyone was like, wow, this was like so amazing. He dives deep on kind of like the relationship to self to kind of like the softer side. It's, he wrote a book and it's not like a how-to manual about regeneration. It's more like what's our role as individuals in regenerating ourselves in order to be a part of this larger movement of regeneration, which is such a thing that's been coming up recently. So this, after that one, everyone just left so energized. And I realized it was such a missed opportunity because I feel like people were so inspired and then they just went off into the ether. And, you know, there was some amazing comments on the event page afterwards, um, which was so cool, but what a chance for all of us to just sit here together for just a short amount of time. Um, and just hear like, what do you guys think of that session? And, you know, do you have any further questions? Like I said, for this one, it's so cool because we can pivot any further technical questions or questions you have for Greg to that Ask a Farmer series next week. So it's like a perfect one to follow up. But also like, this is the whole point of community. We're here all together. There's gotta be some amazing knowledge embedded that is just waiting to be unearthed in the soil of our minds and our hearts that we can share with each other. Um, so yeah, I'd just love to maybe ask everyone um, to, if someone had a, something they really took away from this session or something that Greg said that resonated with them, maybe unmute yourself. And if you feel comfortable, share with the group. And if not, maybe put it in the chat. Tori, I, I, um, can I ask you, what time is the IG live questions? It'll be at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard, 3 p.m. Eastern time next April 2nd. So we just confirmed the time this morning. So I'll put a, an event on Mighty Networks as well. So you guys can just like have that bookmarked. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so there's tons of like technical questions that came through. So we'll just kind of recycle those onto the, onto the session for next week. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so just re resharing that. Did anyone have anything that, you know, Greg said that resonated with them or that stirred up further curiosities? 
Yes, Tori. Um, further curiosity about nutrient-dense food. Anybody in the audience measuring the nutrient density of their, of their vegetables, please? Yeah, 100%. I think that's a... Greg's been diving deep on the work of Dan Kittredge. He didn't get a chance to go into it during the session, but he ordered um, a spectrometer, which is like a light reading device. And Dan Kittredge, Dan Kittredge with He's the head of the Bionutrient, found, or Bionutrient Association. Um, and I'll drop that link actually in the, in the chat so you guys can check out more of his organization and um, the, the spectrometer. But basically what they did um, at Bionutrient Food Association was they were like, we shouldn't be looking at yield per acre. We should really be looking at like nutrition per acre. And how does the world change when we start to orient around trying to drive towards the nutritional basis of our food. Um, if we're not, if we're doing that, automatically soil health comes into the conversation. So it just ends up kind of being like a, a, a reactivity to driving towards nutrition health, which makes sense, right? It's like our food's important. We're trying to nourish ourselves. What's the potential of it to do that if the soil isn't healthy? And then once you then as a byproduct make the soil healthy, there's all of those second and third benefits of carbon sequestration and that kind of stuff, because as we know, and we're all here, um, regenerative agriculture is such a beautiful way to increase soil health. Um, and it has all these other benefits around human health and planetary health. So to do that, they, they set out to do this huge like data study. So they've gotten huge data sets. They sent out prototypes of this spectrometer, this light um, meter. So basically it's almost like you take a picture with a flash of like a carrot and then based on what um, bounces back from the carrot onto the camera, or it's a spectrometer, this tool, they look at that and it gives them, after they've developed this large data set, shows them which like phytochemicals and which minerals and which like nutrients are within the carrots. And from this, they've, between comparing a carrot grown a certain way in Nebraska versus a carrot grown in a different way somewhere else in the world, let's say Canada, that first carrot maybe has the nutritional density. One single carrot has the nutritional density of 90 carrots in the second one grown in Canada, for example. So having a tool and their end game with this, I think is so rad. They want to build it into a phone that can be um, a phone application. So we could just all be rolling around grocery stores or farmer's markets or, you know, our own garden and scanning carrots and being like, this carrot is like green on nutritional density or like this snap pea that I grew over here in the shade with like, you know, I accidentally sprayed Roundup on it or something, which probably wouldn't do. But anyways, that one is like, it's in the red zone of nutritional density. So there's what power, right? And they're trying to make it handheld and trying to really, in some ways, empower citizen science with their work. So definitely, let me drop that link in right now of the Biomutrient Food Association. And you guys can check out the meter. You can check out, they have some information around their work as well. But yeah, Sean, I totally agree. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just piggyback off that. Um, I suffer from fibromyalgia, which is uh, an autoimmune disorder. And I actually just started taking agriculture classes at Alan, Alan Hancock here in Santa, Santa Maria um, and just really started to learn about the importance of the soil health connected to you know, what's going on in my own gut. And I, it made me realize that even though for a long time now I've been trying to eat organic food that a lot of these big operations are still um, not taking care of the soil and not concerned with the soil's health. And so therefore, even though it has this nice label of organic, I, I feel it's lacking in so much of the nutrients that I would find where people are doing regenerative farming and really creating that soil density that the bionutrients that are going to be beneficial to my gut health. It's a good point, Marielle. And if anyone else has anything to jump in and say about that, feel free. But I was just listening to a webinar yesterday with Dr. Browner and Patagonia and Regenerative Organic Alliance. So the creators, ROA, Regenerative Organic Alliance are creating that regenerative organic certification. So kind of like that step up above organic. Um, which is doing exactly like what you were saying. There's when organic came out and then, you know, had to get pushed through in order to like become a thing in the mainstream and that certification process, we've heard from a lot of farmers that it really degraded the, the practices that they, they would typically deem organic 
um, actually are so much less than what the organic standard requires. So you can still, I think it varies potentially um, like from region to region, because I think there's some delineation between state and federal in organic, but like in some cases you can still put certain like biocides onto foods um, with the organic certification. So I think you're so right that like, it's amazing to see ROC trying to like level up. Um, but they talked about that as, uh, you know, for them, it's more of the CPG side, like Dr. Bronner's in Patagonia looking at like fiber and they source olive oil and mint oil and coconut oil, which definitely are like more food-based products. And they're trying to like dive into the supply chain side of that. But the, the food as medicine side is so important too, like to be offered and make it easy and convenient for us to go to a store and buy that kind of food and know actually what we're putting in our body. I feel like the agency that comes with that, I feel you, I have friends with autoimmune diseases and it's one of the hardest things that you tumble down this rabbit hole and then you realize like, wow, um, I'm potentially sick because I just didn't know, like there were no other options, you know? And then once you start to learn the questions to ask, um, it can help you navigate it, but I definitely feel like you should, there's a food as medicine chat that we're hosting um, on April 6th. It's at 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, and I think that one, there's going to be a lot of other, there's a ton of folks in this community, I find that kind of enter the conversation through that access point of food as medicine, of that gut microbiome. Oftentimes, because Zach was a part of the founding team of the nonprofit, a lot of people hear podcasts and are like, whoa, um, I want to learn more about Regen Ag and how that flows up. But thank you so much for sharing. And you asked some amazing questions. Thank you, Marielle. Or is it Marielle? How do you say it? Yeah, uh, Marielle. Yeah, the second one. Thank you. Marielle. Appreciate that information as well. Yeah, I dig your hat too. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So good. Well, if if everyone has a few moments, I'd love to. I'd love to hear a little bit. Um, we had Mario asked a question about perennial tree crops and food forest and food forest for backyards or front yards. So I'm kind of curious if anyone here has any information about food forests or, you know, if they've had experience with that or, you know, pros and cons of perennials, if there's any, if there's any uh, insights there from the group. Hi, Tori. Well, we've been in the process of creating a food forest for the last 10 or 11 years. Yes, you have, Paul. Do you want to, I'd love for you to maybe introduce your work a little bit. I'm so excited by what you're doing in Patagonia yeah. and I feel like others would be too. Yeah, in 2007, we bought a piece of land here in uh, Chile and Patagonia. And uh, in 2009, we came back to Patagonia to to build a house and, and create a small uh, um, farm. And uh, we began planting trees, built the house 2010 from 2011 began planting trees, uh, uh, indigenous species, and um, eventually ended up with a, a very small, uh, um, well, actually not so small, but a productive forest um, where we are increasingly taking the berries off the trees, uh, things like maki, which is a superfood, and, and there's other berries that are well known here um, that are only just coming into the uh, site of, let's say, the outside world. Um, and so we, we, we've created a very nice little forest and then this forest protects our, our permaculture gardens because because we're in Patagonia uh, and we are open to like, well, it's like, we're, like where the three valleys intersect, we're at a confluence of, a river, of two rivers. Um, we're quite prone to strong winds from Antarctica. So the trees shelter the, 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 our permaculture gardens. And we've been preparing since then, because we do not have, um, we're not connected to the, the municipal water, uh, we ca catch all of our water during the summer enough to be able to feed our gardens. And we have a small stream at the back which runs dry for several years as it got increasingly drier um, because of climate change, at least that's what we, we believe. So, um, yeah, we're actively living, in, in, you know, creating this food forest and this talk for us is very, very interesting because we, uh, uh, we're just in the process of creating a cooperative, a 
of friends who have small enterprises connected to tourism, but also connected to the land through the land that, that they uh, um, live on. Uh, here in Patagonia, it's very, very much nature with a philosophy of, uh, um, of, of ensuring that tourism uh, goes beyond sustainable into regenerative and enforcing uh, and, and, and strengthening the local economy um, by increasing biodiversity and protecting the earth through beneficial farming practices. Way too good. <laughs> I'm so excited about what you're doing down there. Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious, what do you think of the thousand tiny farms? Like, could you, could you see that model um, you know, you got you and Greg maybe like brain trusting or, you know, partnering in any way, um, or did you have a different vision for what you're co-oping in Patagonia? No, no, absolutely. It's bang on. It, it, it's bang on because we want to bring food, food to everyone, basically, uh, you know, because here in Patagonia, we're used to being cut off from the rest of the world. Um, and because of that, you know, we, we have a great deal of self-autonomy and and so it's good if people can grow their own food in their you know, own back gardens, um, become nations of farmers rather than warriors. Um, you know, then it, it, I think the small scale farming is the way to go. The small scale farmers, communal farming, like connecting back to the allotment systems, um, or like say medieval times, even through to a place like Germany and Britain where they still have a lot. Um, yeah, this small-scale uh, uh, um, farmer thing, you know, I would definitely want to connect, for sure, for sure, because we're doing the same thing. This this cooperative, we have several farms, we're all friends, we also it's somehow involved in the tourist industry, what gets down here, so we're connecting the tourists to the land, um, but through all of these small farms, and we just opened up a 10-acre piece of land we had that we weren't using, it was... We, well, we're too busy on one piece of land to do another piece of land and we thought well why not open it up to our friends and so we're going to plant more gardens there and then with the cooperative we're going to also trade between ourselves so we won't need to sell as much as we'll be um, just sharing uh, uh, um, and um, uh, yeah, yeah what's the word for yeah like like co-oping resources I could see that even going into you know farming equipment um, I love the idea of almost like bartering in community um, but exactly. really just like sharing in community and then I mean it's like the fire movement right like how do we how do we work less and enjoy life more I think everyone would probably love that <laughs> yeah so. yeah exactly yeah yeah I mean one of the things about it, if you're farming then what you do is you look for the easy way to farm you know and then you find an easier way to farm. And as you get more into the farming, the easier it becomes. Um, you know, and at the same time, you also get pretty fit because you've got to work pretty hard. But, you know, it has a lot of um, uh, um, benefits. You know, you create great friendships with, you know, with your neighbours because you're all in the same boat, you know. And, and if, if your neighbour survives well, then you also survive well, you know. So... Yeah. Um, we feel very fortunate to be living in a community that basically, I think, was more based in the 1850s than it is in the 2020s. <laughs> You're in a time warp down there, and it's lovely, right? <laughs> so funny. That actually it reminds me. I was I was yeah. really lucky to to travel up near um, the northern border of Vietnam and the southern border of China. And it was a super rural community. There's a there's like a really large agricultural rice community there called Sapa. It's like the largest town near it. So we did like a two day walking tour, like hiked 30 miles into like the heart of this valley where they were growing all this rice. And they were sharing with us that that's exactly how they do it. A lot of the families, it's like, you know, a, a classic family farm. It's the matriarch and patriarch and maybe a few children. Um, and they're farming these huge stacked terrace hillsides of rice and they can't do it alone. So everyone in the town, they stagger how they all join together and go do like the transition moments. Cause with rice, you have to uproot it and like do stuff with it. So there's these big pushes of work um, and the whole village will come together and do one terrace. And then they go to the next family's terrace and do that whole terrace together and on and on and on. So, I mean, it's, it's ancient and it's proven to work. And I think you're, I'm so excited and I can't wait to follow along with your work, Paul. It's so rad. 
And it's fantastic. We did what they call here a Minga just on Saturday because we're building a kitchen sort of gallery space for the for the cooperative. And, um, you know, we all got together and, and um, you know, actually went out and built, built got a building. And at the same time, had a feast and, uh, and, and a wonderful get together. And it's it, it reminds you of, of being back in a, you know, probably a more sort of medieval time where, where you know, life in small communities would have been much more um, sharing and giving and, you know, and, and caring. It's very, very nice. I couldn't agree more. It's so beautiful. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, I, oftentimes I feel like we end up talking about the, the technical side, but I'm so glad that you just, um, you just brought up kind of that, that community healing aspect. I think that's in large part where I'm seeing the work as um, a farmer's footprint, but also just like exactly what we're doing right now. It's how do we come together and talk about our beliefs and the way we're viewing the world? And, you know, are we viewing it from an individual perspective or is it more like those rice farmers and what you're doing, Paul, and what Greg is doing with a thousand tiny farms and trying to come together through a community lens? Like what changes in that way? And I'd be really curious actually to hear from, from other folks on the call, um, like, do you have that in your community? Like, do you, and it doesn't even have to be agrarian focused, but like, for example, I feel like I felt that I do ceramics and I feel that at my, my old ceramic studio. And I also, there's a farm here that I volunteer at and go help them like pack CSA boxes. And it's just so full circle, you know, and I know we're in the region ag space. So maybe it is farms for some folks, but I'm really curious, like if, where, where are you feeling that community? especially amidst COVID. I think we need it now more than ever. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I myself, maybe I said to you before, Tori, um, I'm organic farming uh, and I do desire to, to kind of create more community connections. And I, I'd like to be in a way copying some of the work that Paul does. Um, but uh, so in, in the interim, I'm hoping to get engaged in kind of uh, social farming. And, and, and if you're familiar with that term in, in, in the US, social farming? No, I don't know what that is. Yeah, so social farming is where you, you, you allow your farm to be used uh, for people in need in, in the community, whether it be people with uh, mental mm -hmm. disability or, or, or physical disability or people from the, the prison service or refugee service or whatever it might be. So that, that's an avenue that I'm considering in terms of, of, of a, a community engagement. That is so beautiful. Maria, what's going on? I think we call that agroecology over here. I don't know if everybody has heard of Stephen Gleesman. He actually has a dry farming small operation in the Kiwama, um, Kiwama Valley here. And he, he's actually, his textbook is the book that we're using for my sustainability class. And for him, that is the big, you know, the big end game is to create that community and making sure that, um, you know, he says it, the fair trade was a great idea, except that large corporations started to take that over. And so now this idea of agroecology, which is really giving back to the community, making sure um, people, especially women and children who in a lot of countries and areas are a big part of the operation don't really get compensated. And so his thing is really, you know, making sure that it is ensuring stability within the community. And, you know, also just bringing the consumers with the, the producers, bringing that um, farm to table right to your door again. Very good, thank you. Yeah, Marielle, that's amazing, right? I'll drop, I'll drop some of the Stephen Gleason's link. Um, but I think what you're saying is so true. It's like, and Greg was talking about this too, like, is there a way to bring food into places where people are living or to live closer to where food is being grown and start that osmosis process a little more? So it's like, you go to a farm, you point and pick, it's preserving that nutritional density. And then, you know, what is it like to empower others? I love that point, or especially around women and children. I mean, in 70% of the world's food is grown by peasant farmers sorry, 70% of the world's food that's eaten by people is grown by peasant farmers. And depending on the area that you're in, about 40% of those peasant farmers are females, women. So there's huge power there. Like how do we, how do we give that group 
the tools that they need to to grow good nutritionally dense food. Really appreciate you bringing that point up. Are you in a are you in a course right now where you're learning about this? Yes, I'm. I'm taking classes at Alan Hancock in Santa Maria, and um, I I've kind of always been interested in agriculture, but I. Um, I had been going to school years ago and I went for early childhood education and I stopped after I got my associates because I knew it really wasn't what I wanted to do. And then I kind of put off going back to school because I wasn't sure what direction I wanted to take. And then just recently having some experience, especially during the pandemic, I right before it happened, I ended up buying a lot of seeds from Rare Seed uh, Company, which is a really great heirloom really fun varieties, very colorful. What's it called? Uh, rareseeds.com. Ooh. Yeah, it's they, and, and, and I was lucky because I had, I ended up buying a lot of seeds off of there and then the pandemic hit. And when I went back on just to check it out, it was like, everything was sold out. Everybody was, you know, interested in buying uh, seeds, but I, I got to, you know, plant a lot of seeds last year. Um, I didn't succeed so well because there was a lot of things happening here at the house. And so I didn't really have a place to put my seedlings, but I did start to try to sell some of them. And it was just a really fun experience um, working with the plants and just learning from that. And there's also a little community farm over here that I started volunteering at. And I, I was like, you know what, I'm not working right now. I might as well go back to school and I might as well just pick the thing that you know, I'm interested in right now. And so um, I'm just taking a few classes, but I have a great, a great teacher and she's just been really wonderful. And the sustainability class has been really amazing. Just learning about all of these things and just, um, it was actually one of the students that introduced me to you guys. So he, he showed me oh, your cool. Instagram and that's how I'm here. Amazing. That's so rad that you're diving deep into this. Um, do you feel like you have that sense of community since you've been going to that farm and you're just like steeped in, in this course and learning about it? I do. And I, I really feel um, a strong community with just um, my classmates, even though we're, we're pretty much over Zoom right now. Um, but hopefully mm -hmm. we'll be able to get into the community garden over at the school as well. But my teacher has been just such a, a powerful influence. She, you know, really has gone above and beyond, you know, really is into trying to nurture your dreams and your desires and like getting you the right information that you need. She's, she's been really, you know, influential for me. It's amazing. It's so important to have a mentor in these spaces, especially yeah. I find like, like Greg mentioned, um, you know, like it, there's just almost too much information out there so to kind of have like a guided journey um yeah. like starting a garden I've heard that from so many people it's like you need to figure one thing out so you go and do a quick google search and it's like youtube 500 videos and like these blogs like yeah. take yeah. this gardening course it's like it's overwhelming in some ways you know so yeah. to try and like dial it down and have trusted sources and mentors I think is it's so important. Also, there's like two people that really, really love the rare seeds, which is I think a part of Baker Creek, Matt was saying. Yes, so yes, it is. yeah, they great resource. Really great. Um, they actually used to do like a big exposition. Um, I know it got canceled last year. I don't know if they're they'll be holding it this year, but um, and they've got little, you know, plots all over the place. There's there's a place in California as well, but they're they're a really interesting group for sure. And their seeds are just, I mean, you know, so colorful, all of the different colors that you wouldn't imagine the normal vegetables that you buy at the store would come in these extra beautiful colors. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty nice. It's amazing. Yeah. That was something that I felt um, when I started volunteering at this farm near me, uh, it was like, I'd never really spent time in a farm and I was like, Whoa, there's so many apples. And like, who knew there were like 12 different types of lettuce, like the, the variety and like the richness of food, like the taste of course, but also I was like, I didn't know there were this many types of lettuce. Like, it's amazing that growing up, at least myself, my family wasn't super steeped in this knowledge. Um, you know, it was like, I thought there was like maybe like four types of lettuce. And then you, you realize as people are growing it and you're getting closer to it. Uh, I don't know. I just think that diversity really draws you in. And it's like that, that connection and kind of like that magnet of taste, like you get to interact with it on, you know, three square meals a day if you so want. So dig that connection as well. What's going on, Maitland? That's an amazing name. How do you say that? 
just like that, like Maitland. Maitland. Wow. Yeah. Wait, tell us about this. You have a newbie gardening resource. Sure. Yeah, oh, actually. I... Yeah, go for it. No, you go for it. I was just going to say, this is perfect. We, I would just post in the community about doing like a modern book club where we, instead of all reading a book together, we just like pop on for like a conversation. And it's like, we share books that we've read that are tried and true or that we're reading now or like podcasts or like articles and stuff. So this is the test moment, Maitland. Tell us about these books and why you love them, please. <laughs> it's well, it, I have the same problem um, that you were talking about. You go on to YouTube and then you get into this black hole, just 5 million different pieces of advice or like you should get this tool or buy this product or whatever. Um, and so I just, I've been trying to narrow it down. Um, I've been living in DC for the last several years, but I just moved to a place where I've got some land, which is awesome. So I'm starting my first garden aside from having stuff in a windowsill. Um, and so I narrowed it down to these four. Uh, my little brother is a regenerative ag farmer. And so he recommended the soul of soil to me, uh, which was really, really great. And then I just kind of went down a much smaller rabbit hole after that. Um, and the Encyclopedia of Country Living is really cool because it also goes into like canning and um, what to do with your vegetables uh, after you grow them. Um, and that's just been really helpful. And then the Fruit Gardener's Bible and the Vegetable Gardener's Bibles are just exactly what they sound like. It just, it goes through all the different types of vegetables. Like, like you were saying, I didn't realize how many different types of lettuces and things like that there were. So it's just, they're just really good kind of indexes. Um, and there's not a lot of personal stories or advice in them. It's just information. So it keeps me from getting too in my head about making it perfect. Cause I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So just having these basic resources is, has been super helpful. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. What's the soul of soil about? It's, eh. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. It's about the soul of soil. It gets really into the, um, what Greg was talking about, the biology of the soil. Um, it definitely gets into the, like the scientific structures and things like that, which I was nerding out over, but in a really easy, digestible way. Um, like my, my brother went to Virginia Tech um, and studied environmental horticulture. And he said that the soul of soil was like a good little kind of abbreviated textbook. Um, because it gets into everything without kind of bogging you down with stuff that they would only ask you on a test. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so good. I, I feel like we all need, I guess, kind of in some ways, someone like your brother, right? Like kind of that, they always say like, you better hope you have like a, a doctor and a, uh, like a teacher in your family or like a, like a car mechanic in your family, right? Someone that it's just like, do I really need to pay for this? Do I really need to do this? Like someone who yeah. you know has your best interest in mind. So rad that you have that that's so beautiful and appreciate you sharing the resources that he gave totally, so good. Yeah. <laughs> and stoked that you have land this year that's amazing what a huge pivot I bet that feels so good huge gift huge gift no one's more excited than my dog <laughs> <laughs> right on um well guys I want to be respectful of everyone's time and yeah just acknowledge that we are at the end of our time together but I'd love to, before we wrap it, um, just invite anyone to share. I don't know if people are, have been, Marielle, it sounds like you're a little bit newer um, to the conversation in the Farmers Victory community and Paul and Sean, you guys have been around since day one. So thank you guys for sticking around and um, finding value in, in some of this and more so just contributing. Um, so that's really all we're trying to do here is can't meet in person right now, but I, I view kind of the community as the space beyond um, social media where it's like, you know, you're receiving information and then just like listening and maybe you get to comment back. Like we have such an opportunity either on the virtual platform or in live events like this to just share what we know with each other and help each other on this learning journey as we're, you know, catalyzing awareness around regeneration, which some of that is on the land and some of it's within ourselves. So I always open for suggestions. Um, I actually didn't introduce myself. I realized in the session, but I'm Tori. I've worked at Farmers Footprint for about six months. Um, and I had a community, so you'll see me in the virtual platform and seriously, it's this whole space is for you guys. So if there's anything you want to see, if you want to post a session, if there's something that, you know, is really lighting you up or you're curious about, drop me a line and we can spin something up and, you know, make everything 
beautiful and better for each other. So really appreciate you guys jumping in in your time today. It was so good to see some familiar and especially some, some new faces. So thank you guys. I'm around with any questions. Um, and just super quick plug for upcoming events because we do have some really good ones coming up. Um, next, next, next week, there'll be a farm side chat with, um, the force of nature community. So if you guys want to check that event out, it's here. And then I, I can't point people enough to this food as medicine chat um, that's happening the day before that. So on April 6th. So here's the two event links. And if you guys want to head to the events space in general and check out, I host, um, we host as like a, it's like a group, um, just farmers footprint events in there, but also I use it as a hub to point towards other workshops or other webinars that are going on. So you'll notice the difference if it has like a farmer's footprint logo over the picture, that's a farmer's footprint event. And if it doesn't, then it's hosted by someone else. So you guys can probably register directly with them, but trying to orient farmer's footprint is just a space where anyone can arrive and then, you know, branch out into the resources that make the most sense to them. So awesome. Well, that's enough about me, but thank you guys so much. You're amazing. Um, yeah, we'll see you guys soon. Really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your Friday and a happy weekend. Awesome. Thank you, Tori. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Cindy. Good to meet you. Bye -bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye, Maitland. Bye, Paul.